Thank you. I love that video. I've seen that video dozens and dozens of times. And I can't help but think of what it was like us as kids growing up. You know, we get told to do something and we figure out three or four reasons why we didn't do it. And what, <laughs> and, and Francis Chan, if you ever read any of his writings, if you watch any of his other videos, is just so inspiring. He is a man who is just his passion, his exuberance for the Lord, just transcends whatever the topic is that he's talking about. And it's really good. I highly recommend that. He has a book called Crazy Love. And that was the first book of his that I ever read. And it will do a lot of things for you. It will humble you. It will lift you up to new heights. And so I just recommend that book, if you're a book reader, that you won't regret reading that book. How often? Do we find ourselves learning more about something than we ever wanted to know or ever cared to know? For instance, a lot of us are maybe parents or grandparents, aunts or uncles, whatever it might be, and it's coming around Christmas time, and we now have a bicycle to put together. Or we might have gone to the, the furniture store, and now we have this cabinet that comes in a flat box. And so we empty these boxes out, and parts go everywhere, and these little instructions kind of come around. Did I lose that? My bad. Okay, there. And so, uh, um, and so there's like little instructions that are laying there, and you'll look at the instructions, and it might be 38 pages long, and about three of them are in English. So that's great, you know, but I don't speak any of those other languages, so that doesn't help me. So you kind of study it, and you kind of look at it and try to put it all together, and then you kind of come to the end of the project, and it's like, ooh, I don't think the handlebars are supposed to be on that end of the bike. And, or that furniture, right, the doors, one opens in, one opens out. Maybe the doors are even upside down. So um, when we have these kind of things, sometimes the instructions are very simple, like way too simple, and sometimes they're very vague. And so when we see that, there's a lot of times, what will we do? We will maybe call on somebody and, and, and try to study deeper and see how, well, you built a bike, how'd you do it? And how did it end up? Or, or maybe, oh, I love the, this furniture that you built. Mine doesn't look anything like it, but it's the same catalog number. Can you help me with this, right? And then, then you might even go to YouTube. Right? YouTube is like the holy grail for DIY people because this is where you learn how to do all these crazy things. Oftentimes the project ends up wrong. Sometimes it just falls to the wayside and never gets completed, which can be a very challenging Christmas morning. But that's, that's another story altogether. Well, the daughter in this story is very much in that situation, right? She is not out of alignment with scripture. She's memorizing. She's digging deeper. She can do it in Greek, right? She's calling people together. But Chan makes it clear where she's falling short and what we can learn from it. And that leads us into the first point for today. Because we are certainly to memorize scripture study scripture and seek counsel all sorts of scripture supports this we look at colossians 3 16 let the teaching of christ live in you richly use all wisdom to teach and instruct each other by singing psalms hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to god well, of course, that just makes all the sense in the world, doesn't it? And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And then we can look at 2 Timothy 3.16. Do you ever notice how many verses get quoted that are 3.16s? When you read the Bible, yeah, it's all over. It's, it's kind of odd, isn't it? But in any case, so we're in 2 Timothy. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing people what is wrong in their lives, for correcting faults, and for teaching how to live right. And then in 2 John. And love means living the way God commanded us to live. And you have heard from the beginning, his command is this. Live a life of love. Now, isn't that a wonderful commandment? Live a life of love. So often we might look at the Bible, we might look at scripture, and all it seems to be is a rule book 
that we struggle with and try to get through because we don't want to do this wrong. We don't want to do that wrong. We, you, all these things. But he commands us, live a life of love. And we know that love covers a multitude of shortcomings, covers a multitude of sin, right? We know these things. And it impacts us. It impacts the way we see ourselves. When you look in a mirror, you've heard this many times probably. When you look in a mirror, what do you see? Who do you see? Do you take time to do that? What's your identity? For many of us, one of our identities, right, are the relationships that we have. Our relationship, we might be a parent, we might be a grandparent, might be an aunt, we might be an uncle, might be cousin, brother, sister, friend, neighbor. All kinds of things that we have in our various relationships. Maybe you see yourself as what you do. Maybe you look in the mirror and you see a carpenter. Maybe you look in the mirror and you see a plumber. Maybe an electrician, maybe a doctor, a lawyer. Any number of things, but oftentimes this is what our identities end up rolling around. Now, I am a DIY guy. <laughs> Not a very good one, but I am one. But I like it, right? Because it just makes me feel good. We bought a condo about six years ago. We had lived over in Oviedo for a great number of years. And we bought a condo, and, and it, was a, it was a bank repossession thing, and, and we got it, and, and it needed a lot of work. And after we went to closing, the first thing I did when I walked into the place, got a hammer and said, this closet's going, wham! And I break this whole break, big hole right into the closet, and it felt good. Demo's fun. If you're a demo person, you know demoing things is fun because you can't hardly get it wrong unless you hit a pipe. And then things go wrong really quick. But now, and other things, right, that you do in these kind of things, I'm not a drywaller, but I can hang drywall. I can take drywall. I can spackle drywall. I can get the gun and texture drywall, and that can be hilarious, by the way, until you get that adjusted. It's like you back the cow into there, and it, it's ugly. But anyway, but so there's a lot of different things that you can do. Um, I, I can do electric. I can do a little bit of electric, and nothing's burned down yet, although I have electrocuted myself once. And I can do plumbing, but I am really not a plumber. Plumbing terrifies me. Well, the long and short of this is that we all have various identities and relationships, don't we? And we might be any number of things in our worldly walk. But in our worldly walk, you've heard this uh, example before, right? We have our worldly relationships, right? Our horizontal, our worldly things. And all of these things are temporal, right? All these things are going to come to pass. But we have a vertical relationship with God. And that's eternal. And what we must be mindful of is the big picture of our identity, which raises the question, what about our relationship with Jesus? As followers of Jesus, we're not terrible, are we? We kind of tithe. If it doesn't mean we can't go without gas. We, we kind of do what scripture says most of the time. Certainly when it's convenient. We try to be good. We try to do the right things. But we must remember who we really are in the big picture. In our spiritual walk, in our walk with Christ, we have a spiritual identity and are everything Scripture says that we are. And unfortunately, most of us myself included, we don't see that when we look in the mirror. Number two, remember who you are. John 1, but to all who did accept him and believe in him, he gave the right to become children of God. They did not become his children in any human way, by any human parents or human desire. They were born of God. Think about that. Let that sink in. The creator of all things adopts you as his child. It's pretty big. Pretty big. Therefore, Colossians 3.12, therefore we are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Holy. 
set apart. We're chosen. We're chosen people. And God loves us dearly. Again, just put that on the big, big picture. I saw a little, little picture of Facebook the other day that kind of puts us into perspective a little bit. And the picture was just sort of a fingertip, and it had just a few grains of sand on it. And the whole background was the Sahara Desert. And the caption was, this is like your life, these couple of little grains of sand, and this is eternity. Think of being a child of God, adopted by God himself, and being of his chosen people for eternity. Gigantic, gigantic. 2 Corinthians 5. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun, and all of this is a gift from God, a gift, who brought us back to himself through Christ. He gathered us back to himself in Christ. We were enemies. We were fallen to sin, and he has gathered us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Time out. This isn't that hard. You don't have to learn this in Greek. This means share the good news. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. And it is a wonderful message. It's the hinge that keeps us from plummeting into eternity apart from Christ to joining God's family, to being adopted, to being of the chosen people. So we are Christ's ambassadors. Have you looked in the mirror and seen yourself as an ambassador? I hope you do because you are. The Bible says you are. Bible is infallible. You are an ambassador, but too few times do we look at ourselves, much less do it. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ. Whoa, we're speaking for Christ. Let that one resonate a little bit too. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Someone once told me, after sharing the gospel with me, when I was at the very edge of eternity apart from God, and he shared the gospel, and he looked at me and said, what about you? Three words. Changed everything. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. It just nails it, right? It just nails it. We must, must, must let this identity become woven into the fabric of our being. You see, when, when, when the fall in, in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, right, and, and sin occurred and disobedience, and that thread of sin is woven into the fabric of all of us. It's inherent. It's something that we deal with until that final day when we're glorified that we will then be washed pure once and for all. So in the meantime, how about if we weave that into the fabric of our being, that identity? Now, being reminded of who we are, let's look at what we are to do. In the video, Chan makes it very, very clear that who we call Lord must be treated as Lord. It's easy for us, right? We're, we're lost and we know we're broken and we're in a bunch of pieces. We're in a puddle. And they say, look, we can, you can get together. You don't have to worry about this. We have a savior. We have salvation. But we also have a Lord. And that's something oftentimes people think, okay, I got my Willy Wonka chocolate ticket. I'm going to heaven. But then they turn their back on the Lord. 
It's not the way it's supposed to be. I think if we're transparent enough to confess, all of us all too often will put ourselves up on the throne. And only in times of trouble, only in times of conflict, only in times of despair, will we reach over to Jesus and say, Jesus, you need to get back up here in your rightful place because I ain't got this. And then as soon as things start going smooth again or something else happens, we're back up on the throne. Sometimes we're not even aware of it. I have a friend who works in, um, works for the government. And he's very successful. He's one of these people that are boisterous, very overconfident, kind of puffy, kind of hard to digest many times, but a good guy. And, and so he has risen himself up to a certain status and, and they get graded all the time on what they do. And, and all of a sudden where he's been like a straight A student in his career, he got an F. His world like fell apart. Now this is a fella of faith. This is a fella who, you know, is, it's been around church, part of church all of his life. And now all of a sudden his world's crumbling. He's sinking into the depression. Why? Because somebody said he got an F. I couldn't digest that at all. Where's your faith? Don't you understand that all that we have, all that we are, all that's given to us is provided by the Lord. It's not on our own accord. Sure, we have to be boots on the ground. I get that. But this fellow didn't have a clue. And I just think that he was really missing the point of who he should be thankful for, what he should be thankful about. And that applies to each and every one of us. Are we missing the point like the girl in the video? We will be held accountable for it someday. Make no mistake. But we can repent of this behavior. And repenting, a lot of times people think of repenting as, okay, well, I'm going to stop buying lottery tickets when it's one point gazillion dollars, and I'm going to stop doing this, and I'm going to stop doing that, and I'm going to start going back to church, and I'm going to start doing this, and I'm going to start tithing, and I'm going to do this or that or something else. But it's a bigger picture. Repenting is turning. And I like to think of repenting, and this is what I share. Yes, all these little things are important. Make no mistake, that's not what I'm saying. But there's a bigger picture when you're looking at repentance. Because all this horizontal that we have in life, all of these things that mean so much to us are temporal. They are going to pass. What is important is our vertical. And what I look at repentance is I am turning from the horizontal. I'm not being negligent or derelict in the horizontal, but I'm turning from the horizontal focus to the vertical focus. And when you turn to the ver vertical focus, a couple things are going to come. A couple things are going to happen. Billy Graham has a great quote. Tithe your time. Each of us has the same amount of time every day, 1,440 minutes a day, 168 hours a week, the days of our lives. That's a soap opera, isn't it? The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Psalm 90, 10, Billy Graham. It's important for us to keep in mind that our worldly clocks are ticking. Now is the time. Number three, remember who is Lord and obey. Matthew 22, verses 37 through, 30 through 41. Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and most important command. And the second command is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law, not some of it, all the law, and the writings of the prophets depend on these two commands. For all of us who struggle with the all the different things that scripture says we are to do or not do. I love that Jesus kind of simplifies this to two things. 
and I still can't get them right. There are many days when I'm not thinking about God first at all. I'm just going through the motions, one foot in front of the other. There are many days when I look at somebody else and go, man, I'm glad I'm not her. Glad I'm not him. That guy's a jerk. These are not the way we're supposed to love one another, right? So we're closing in on the destination now, this message. We are to, one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Number two, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, as we do this, and this should be always in the forefront of all we do, we are indeed remembering who our Lord is and are obeying when we do that. But we are not to stop there, are we? I think not. There are many ways to love our neighbors, and I can't think of any more important than obeying the Lord as he commands us. I can't imagine anything more important than sharing the good news. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Now, I majored in evangelism when I went to Liberty to get my seminary. And you can do the gospel 18 dozen different ways. But it doesn't matter. Because you cannot intellectualize anybody to conversion, to salvation. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. None of us must have this memorized. None of us must know it in Greek. None of us must form together in groups to discuss how this would look if we would just start sharing the word with somebody. We share as we go. I think we can all agree that we believe God created everything. That God created man in his image. And when he was done doing that, he said, this is really good. Very good, actually. But same point. We know the story of Adam and Eve. And the fall in the garden. Man's disobedience and that we're all inherently sinful. Look at little babies, right? These little cute little babies. And give them one thing and see them fight and tug at each other. It's a sin nature that we have. We all know of the virgin birth of Jesus. We all know of the events of Calvary. We all know what happened on the third day. And each and every person here who has received Jesus as their Lord and Savior knows what it's like to put your faith in Jesus and have your life changed. You don't need to memorize anything very specific. Just share what Jesus has done for you with others. Oftentimes, people's final words are recorded for prosperity. I can think of no one ever more important or words more important than the words of Jesus. His final words as recorded by Matthew. Most of us are familiar with this. The Great Commission. The 11 followers went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus has told them to go. They obeyed. On the mountain, they saw Jesus and worshipped him. But some of them did not believe it was really Jesus. Then Jesus came to them and said, All power in heaven and on earth is given to me. Jesus again establishes who he is. That he is Lord. So go and make followers of all people in the world. They obeyed. The world changed. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey. Are we following the storyline here? 
Teach them to obey everything that I have taught you, and I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. Friends, we are not alone in this. Jesus is with us. He's with each and every one of us. Remember that when you have that glance in the mirror and you're doing the checkup from the neck up, who you are and who's on board. There are many ways to obey this command, the final command of our Lord. And we're just about at the end here. I want to share one more story with you. usually a challenge for me to tell a story, but it's important. We are to share the good news. Fifteen, twenty years ago, somebody invited one of my sons to church, vacation Bible school. He went. He heard the gospel. Somebody shared the gospel with him. He chose to receive the Lord. Wasn't among anything I had to do with it. I was still living very secularly. He was doing this because the Lord moved him to do so. Somebody cared enough about him and his eternity more so than I did, which is humiliating. He received the Lord, he got baptized. Then about 10 years ago, he decided to go home to be with the Lord in our home in the middle of the night. And it was those events that led me to the Lord. Pastor came over to our house and he said, I know where your son went. And I just looked at him, huh? He goes, yeah, I know where your son went. Okay. You guys want to know why? I said, okay. I said, he was a pastor at that church, at that BBS. Shared the gospel. Son received the gospel from him. Invited Jesus into his heart. Same fellow baptized him. The same fellow's in our house. Ask me, what about me? All because one person extended an invitation to my son to come to church. Come and see. Friends, we have responsibility. We don't know how it's going to fall out, but we all each have responsibility to share the good news, to invite others to join us here at worship. I am eternally grateful to somebody I don't know. Perhaps I'll meet him someday in the promised land. Whoever that fellow was who invited him. In today's bulletin, there is a track again. And I hope those of you who were here last week and took tracks with you found places to put them. They are seeds. There's power in them. There's scripture in these tracks. There's power in scripture. Make no mistake about it. It's terrific. If you can take time and talk to people right up front and share the gospel. But if not, at least leave the seed. Leave it there. So I ask again that we obey and scatter these seeds, plant these seeds, share if you can. If not, leave it behind. Let the Holy Spirit do what he cares to do with it. Lord's word never returns void, ever. We don't know where they'll go. Had a fellow last night come, he goes, I leave tracks out everywhere I go. I said, that's wonderful, How, what do you do? He goes, he goes to Walmart, like in the men's section, right? And where there's shirts, he goes around and he'll just take these and just put them in the pockets of the shirts. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, I'm not kidding, not making this up. And, and then, was, then he also said, oh, and then he'll go to the baby section. And where there's packages of diapers, he said he'll put one, like, inside the package. So then when mom or dad or whoever's opening the package of diapers, they'll get this message, too. You can be creative. You can leave it anywhere that you might get the inspiration to do so. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching. For showing people what is wrong in their lives. For correcting faults and for teaching how to live right. We're to go. We're to share. Invite. We are to obey our Lord. Join me in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word today. Lord, I ask that you inspire each and every person here, those that are watching from home, to obey, to go, to share the good news, to invite others to come and join us in worship, that none should perish, and that all come to receive you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we are thankful for all who are here today, for all who give of their time and their energy and their resources to make these services happen. Lord, forgive us for our shortcomings and inspire us to fulfill your plans for each and every one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.